In the previous video, you learned about linear relationships between pairs of channels, and you learned that when you have a large data set with lots and lots of channels, you can represent all of the pairwise relationships using a matrix or covariance matrix. In this video, I'm going to show you the formula that allows you to create a covariance matrix. In the next couple videos, you will also see how to implement this formula in code in MATLAB, and for now I'll just show you the, the math of it. This will allow you to further understand the relationship between covariance and correlation, and I'll show you lots of examples of covariance matrices, different ways of constructing co covariance matrices, and some things to look for that might be a little bit suspicious that should make you investigate the data further, whether there might be any sources of noise or bad channels. So here we have two formulas. This one is to compute each individual element of a covariance matrix. So the covariance between channel X and channel Y is equal to some normalization factor. You don't have to worry too much about this. And it's basically all the individual elements in X times all the individual elements in Y. So it's really that simple. It's each element in X times each corresponding element in variable Y. It's important that these variables are mean centered, so you have to take each individual element and subtract the mean. So you subtract the mean of X from each individual element of X, and you subtract the mean of Y from each individual element of Y, and then you multiply those together. Then there's another normalization factor, which is one over N, basically, or N minus one. And this really just prevents the correlation or the covariance from getting larger and larger and larger with larger signals. This turns out to be simply the dot product between variable X and variable Y if those variables are mean-centered. And then you can just write X transpose times Y, assuming that X and Y are both column vectors. So this is the formula that gives you one individual element in this large covariance matrix. We can also use matrix notation to represent exactly the same formula over all possible pairs of X and Y. So that's capital C, so matrix C, equals the same normalization factor, and then it's X transpose times X, where X is a data matrix. And here I'm assuming, although I don't write it out explicitly, we're assuming here that the rows of X are all mean-centered. So the average of each signal over time would be zero. Now this can be a little bit confusing, and you'll see this in MATLAB, because this formula is either X transpose times X or X times X transpose, and that really just depends on how the data are stored in the matrix, if it's channels by time or time by channels. So time by channels would mean you'd want to flip the first matrix, and then you end up with a channels by channels matrix. So these are the formulas for covariance. This is the formula for a correlation. This is a Pearson correlation coefficient. This is just a screenshot from the Wikipedia page on the correlation coefficient. And what you'll notice is that this element-wise formula is identical to the numerator for a Pearson correlation coefficient. Well, almost. I don't have this n minus 1 over n minus 1 business in here. So this shows you the relationship between a covariance and a correlation. So the Pearson correlation coefficient is the same thing as a covariance coefficient, except that the Pearson correlation coefficient is also normalized. So it has a denominator here, and this is basically just normalizing for the total variance in the two signals. And that's not in here. And this 1 over n minus 1 business, the only reason why you don't need to include that here is because this normalization factor would be both in the numerator and in both of these terms in the denominator. So it would be inside the square root here and here, and n has to be the same. So this would be, you know, the sa this same factor would be in the numerator and in the denominator. So this is the more formal relationship between correlation and covariance. They are the same except for a normalization factor that goes into the correlation that is not present in the covariance.
So this seems pretty trivial. These are both relatively simple formulas to implement. Particularly, this one is really easy to implement in MATLAB. But computing a co covariance matrix is a little bit tricky. It's not as trivial as you might think. So the formula itself is reasonably trivial. The issue is selecting the data and how do you pick the data that go into the covariance matrix. I will have much more to say about that in later sections of this course because it turns out that how exactly you define these covariance matrices and what you do with the data to get them into the covariance matrix, how you select data for the covariance matrix, that is really the key to spatial filters, is how you select the data. Here I want to give you a gentle introduction into this concept. So what I'm showing here is a bunch of channels of data, and there's some covariance structure. You can already see that from this plot. So some of these channels are going up a little bit, and some of these channels are going down a little bit. So there's some positive correlations and some positive correlations here, and then negative correlations between this group of channels and this group of channels. So what I did was simulate these data two different ways. One, I simulated the data to be phase-locked over trials. So this is time here, and each line is now actually one channel. So this is multiple channels from one trial, or one repetition. This is multiple trials, multiple repetitions from one channel. So in this case, you can see that all of the trials have the same kind of temporal phase structure. So they all start going up and then down and up and so on. You can see that for all the trials. Now here, I took actually the same exact covariance matrix that defines the relationships across the different channels, but the phase was different on each trial. So you can see that you know, this trial starts going down, this trial starts going up, and so on. So now computing the covariance matrix for this data set and this data set can give quite different results. So what you see here is this is the covariance matrix when I first averaged all the trials together and then computed one covariance matrix. So that would mean here I first averaged all of these signals together, all of these trials together, this is for one channel, average all of these trials together and then compute one covariance matrix. Now when I do that for data set two, the covariance matrix is almost zero. These are all on the same color scale. So if you look carefully, you can see there is some structure which looks a little bit like this, but it's almost entirely zero. So we've lost a huge amount of information just by averaging over all the trials first and then computing the covariance matrix. Here, what I did was compute the covariance matrix separately for each trial. So in this case, let's say there's like 30 trials. So I computed the channel by channel covariance matrix for this trial and then the covariance matrix for this trial and for this trial and this trial and so on, I end up with 30 covariance matrices and then I average all 30 of those covariance matrices together and that gives me one covariance matrix. So, and then it's interesting to see that that covariance matrix is pretty much identical or at least really, really similar for data set one, which was phase locked and data set two, which was non-phase locked. There's also quite a difference in the diagonal. I'll talk about this more in a minute. So the point is that you have to think really carefully about how to compute the covariance matrices because that has real implications in real data sets for the kinds of results that you will be able to find, the kinds of features that you will be able to extract from the data. Now, these are simulated data, so obviously this is a, a bit of an extreme case. But this is fairly realistic in the sense that brain data and many other biological signals have some phase-locked component and some non-phase-locked components. So now what I'd like to do is show you a few examples of covariance matrices and help you interpret the covariance matrices. Covariance matrices are so important for multivariate data sets. You should always be inspecting your covariance matrices to look for patterns or suspicious behavior of the covariances. So what you see, the difference between these two matrices is all the off diagonals look pretty much the same, but the diagonal elements are really different between these two. 
So the diagonal elements in a covariance matrix encode the variance of each signal. It's the covariance of each channel with itself. So it's like the auto covariance, which is just called variance for simplicity. So when a channel is kind of moving up and down a lot over time, then it will have a high variance. And when a channel doesn't have a lot of dynamics, when it doesn't move around a whole lot, then it's going to have a low variance. So for a correlation matrix, the diagonals are always one. But for a covariance matrix, the diagonals are not constrained to be one. The diagonals just reflect however much variance is in the signal. So let me show you why that is the case here with this formula. So the elements on the diagonal correspond to the case where x equals y. So you can imagine this also being x. So what's happening in the numerator here is you have each element of x times each element of x, which means x squared. So the numerator is all of the individual elements in the signal squared, and then you sum over all of the squared elements. Now, if you're computing a correlation, you have the elements squared and then summed, and then the elements squared and summed and the square root of that, and the elements squared and summed and then the square root of that. So essentially, you end up with three terms that are exactly identical. You have this term here is equal to this term here is equal to this term here. And then this is the square root and this is the square root. So these multiply together to give you the same term on the top and on the bottom. So that's why the correlation will be one. But if you're computing covariance and not correlation, you don't have this denominator here. So if there is if the signal is more variable, then these squared elements just get bigger and bigger and bigger. They're scaled down a little bit by this normalization factor, but they still get much bigger. So that is the difference between the diagonal elements of a correlation matrix, which are all ones, versus the diagonal matrix of a covariance matrix, which just tells you about how much the signal is moving around over time. OK, so with that said, when you can see the diagonal popping out of a covariance matrix, it means that the variance in the data in each individual channel is much higher than the covariance across the different channels. So whatever is the relationship between different channels, the relationship or the, the variability within each individual channel is much higher. And when you don't see the diagonal popping out of a covariance matrix, it means that the amount of variability within each channel is roughly the same as the, the size of the relationship or the magnitude of the relationship across different pairs of channels. Now, the reason why this happens in this particular simulated data set is because I added a lot of noise. Now, all of these high frequency things, this is purely random noise, which means sometimes over trials, sometimes it's going to be a little bit higher and sometimes it's going to be a little bit lower. So when you average all these together, the noise is going to average out and the grand average, the average across all the trials is going to be much less noisy for each individual channel. But because this is all random noise, that doesn't affect the relationships across the channels. So in this particular simulation, the way I set up this simulation, this diagonal really just reflects the fact that I've added noise, random noise to each individual channel. Here is another thing to look for in a covariance matrix. You want to see some spatial structure in the covariance matrix. This is important because the main thing that we are going to be using these covariance matrices for is trying to decompose them, which will essentially try to find patterns or the structure in these matrices. So if there is no structure in these covariance matrices, then there's really nothing to extract. There's no patterns in this matrix that reflect some underlying lower dimensional structure or a system that's generating these data. On the other hand, it's not necessarily so simple to interpret the difference between this and this. And that's because whether these covariance matrices really look pretty and kind of, you know, well organized also depends on the ordering of the channels. So what I did here was take literally exactly this same matrix, but I just randomly sorted all of the channels. So the information in this matrix is identical to the information in this matrix. It's just that 
this is ordered in a kind of nice visual format, and this is not ordered. So if your measurement sensors have some inherent spatial organization, let's say if they're microphones and they're placed in, in an array or some, something, or if these are electrodes and you want to group neighboring electrodes with each other in the data set so that if there is spatial structure in the covariance matrix, you will be able to see it just by looking at it. So if I saw a covariance matrix that looked like this, I would, my first reaction would be suspicion. I would wonder if something went wrong. And then in this case, I would look into the data and I would hopefully discover that there's nothing really wrong, just that the channels are not sorted in any meaningful way. So if possible, I would try to sort all the channels according to, let's say, their, their physical distance relative to each other, and that makes the covariance matrix much easier to interpret. Here is another example. What I did here was take one channel and I zeroed out all the data. So there's a dead sensor in this data set. Now again, whether you can really interpret this so easily as a dead sensor depends a little bit on the organization of the channels. Because this is also, you know, this line here is also green and that there's nothing wrong with this channel. It's just not really strongly correlated with any of the other sensors. There is a dead giveaway here though, which is the zero variance. So the conclusion from this slide is that if you see something that looks like this, if you see a covariance matrix that looks like this, in particular with the diagonal element also looking really unusual, then it doesn't necessarily mean that there is something wrong with the data, but I would inspect this channel and figure out if something went wrong with this channel. Here's the last example I'll show. What I did in this case was replace one of the channels with large amplitude noise fluctuations. So there's no meaningful signal in this channel. I just replaced the whole thing with large random numbers. Now in this case, it's pretty obvious that there's something weird going on with this channel. This channel looks very, very different from all the other channels in the data set. That was less obvious in this case, where I just zeroed out the data. Again, if I saw a covariance matrix that looked like this, I would be immediately suspicious, and I would start investigating the data and see if I can figure out what's going wrong with this channel. So in this video, I showed you the mathematical definitions for covariance and correlation. I introduced you to the idea that how you select data for a covariance matrix is really important. This is a non-trivial aspect of doing spatial filtering and source separation. And I also showed you several examples of covariance matrices and what to look for that might draw some suspicion that would cause you to look at the data more carefully to see if something went wrong.